When we come to the text of the New Testament and try to determine what the autographs are actually about, one of the great problems we have is the amount of material that we have to look at. Now, I'm going to compare this material to what other ancient Greco-Roman literature looks like in terms of their uh, material remains of these various authors. And that's why I've uh, entitled this uh, lesson, An Embarrassment of Riches. So if we take, for example, three Roman historians from the first century approximately AD, uh, on whom we're basing most of our understanding of what ancient Rome was like, we've got Livy, Suetonius, and Tacitus. Now, Livy, we are waiting 300 years before we see any copies of his writings and we don't see the full array of what he wrote about Roman history. Most of it's simply lost forever without any knowledge of where it went to. We have a grand total of about 30 copies of Livy in existence today that we can examine to try to see what he had to say. Another ancient Roman historian uh, was known as Tacitus, and we are waiting for 800 years before we see any copies of Tacitus's works and the grand total that we have are three. Three copies of Tacitus, and yet he's one of the great Roman historians to give us the information that we need on the, the history of Rome in and around uh, the first century AD as well as uh, before that time. A third author, Suetonius, we have quite a bit of material from Suetonius. We have over 200 manuscripts from Suetonius. But again, like Tacitus, we are waiting 800 years before we get any copies of his writings. Now, if we were to compare this to the New Testament documents, you would see that we have an embarrassment of riches, and it truly is an embarrassment for New Testament scholars, which creates kind of an existential crisis of how do we approach this material, what can we safely disregard, at least to some extent, as we examine the more important materials. Here's the data. We have, for our New Testament manuscripts, at, at the present time, close to 5,800 copies of these manuscripts in Greek alone. Now, if you were to wipe out all of the Greek manuscripts, this is what the text of the New Testament was originally written in, Greek. If you were to wipe out all of those, we could still reproduce the text of the New Testament many, many times over from the witnesses that we have in Latin, which were uh, as early as the second century, in the Latin text, we have over 10,000 copies of Latin manuscripts of the New Testament in existence today. Uh, we could reproduce the text in Latin and Coptic. Coptic is an ancient uh, Egyptian language. It's essentially Egyptian hieroglyphics that are put into Greek letters. And uh, that, the Coptic text starts as early as the third century. We have hundreds of Coptic uh, manuscripts today. In fact, we have probably at least 1,500 Coptic manuscripts, if not quite a few more, that have not yet been cataloged uh, all around the world. There's many, many Coptic New Testament manuscripts that are simply not yet cataloged and therefore not known to New Testament scholars. Besides Coptic, we also have Syriac, another very, very important ancient uh, copy of the New Testament, and we have hundreds of copies of Syriac. Then the New Testament was translated into many other languages. It was translated into Georgian, into Gothic, into Arabic. It was translated into Old Church Slavonic, into Anglo-Saxon and Armenian. We have so many copies of the New Testament in all these versions that there are surely between 15,000 and 20,000 copies of the New Testament, not in Greek, written on hand, written manuscripts. So it's, it's, a, it's an embarrassment of riches. Then you add to that the over 5,000 copies of the New Testament in Greek, and we've got uh, over 20,000 copies, well over 20,000 copies most likely, of the New Testament in various languages before the time of the printing press. Now I should mention uh, something that is true both for the New Testament and for these other ancient authors, and that is this. A copy of one of these ancient documents does not mean that it's a complete copy. We have our earliest manuscripts for the New Testament as well as the earliest manuscripts for Livy and for Suetonius and Tacitus are going to be those that are fragmentary texts. The earlier you go, the less likely it is that you're going to have a complete copy. In fact, the oldest complete New Testament manuscript that we have in existence, which happens to be in Greek, and it happens to be an exceedingly important manuscript, is Codex Sinaiticus, which is housed now at the British Library in London. It's written in about the middle of the 4th century, somewhere around AD 350, give or take 25 years. 
and it's a complete New Testament. That's our oldest complete New Testament. However, we also have a number of manuscripts that, although fragmentary, have quite a bit of text up to that point. Now, I've mentioned the number of copies we have for the New Testament, and that gives us an embarrassment of riches. But I haven't talked to you about the dates. As you recall, with Livy, Suetonius, and Tacitus, we're dealing with the earliest manuscripts coming 300 years, and those are only of Livy. And then uh, Suetonius and Tacitus, we're waiting 800 years before we get copies. These are fairly representative for ancient Greco-Roman authors. Uh, the, the, the best among them is going to be Homer, and of course Homer has an 800 year head start over uh, first century authors, so uh, he's got quite a few more copies than these other authors do, but not more copies than in the New Testament. Uh, Homer is in a, a league by itself, but I, I'll just summarize this and say that we have approximately 1,000% as many copies of the New Testament in its various languages as we do copies of Homer. It's a remarkable difference, and he is in second place in terms of literary remains among all Greco-Roman literature. Huge disparity. Now, in terms of the date of these New Testament manuscripts, the earliest come from the second century, from within 100 years of the completion of the New Testament. Scholars have pointed to a fragment of John's Gospel known as P52, or Papyrus Number 52, that is housed at Manchester University in the John Rylands Library today. Manchester University in central England had a scholar who was uh, wrestling with the data in the, the library back in 1934, and he was a, a bona fide papyrologist. His name was Colin H. Roberts. He found this fragment in uh, the John Rylands Library, and he said, this looks like it's um, from the New Testament. I mean, he, he was a papyrologist, so he's dealing with other kinds of texts, and looking for a New Testament manuscript among the papyri is like looking for the proverbial needle in a haystack. About one-tenth of one percent of all published papyri are actually uh, New Testament manuscripts, so it's, it's pretty hard to find them. But uh, he discovered this quite by accident, and said, I think this is from the New Testament. Sure enough, it was. On one side of this papyrus leaf was John chapter 18, verses 31 through 33, and on the other side was John 18, verses 37 and 38. And so a year later, Roberts published this papyrus, P52. It got published in 1935, but he had circulated photographs of it to the three leading papyrologists of Europe at the time, and each one independently wrote back to him and said, we believe that this manuscript should be dated no later than, a, than A.D. 150 and as early as A.D. 100. A fourth one wrote back and said, I think that this manuscript is probably written in the last decade of the first century, so in the 90s. That was a remarkable discovery, and it really changed an awful lot of ways in how biblical scholars have looked at when John's gospel was written. One wag even said, well, the ink of John's Gospel must have been barely dry when P52 was copied from it. And so uh, the idea was that John's Gospel was very, very late middle of the second century, something like that. Well, since that time, a number of other manuscripts have been discovered. This is one that has just what, half a dozen verses, and it's only the size of the palm of my hand. But um, uh, other manuscripts have also been discovered that uh, are apparently from the second century. The scholars have debated in more recent years what the date of P52 is. We're not exactly sure because it doesn't say this was written at this time, and so we've got to make comparisons of this manuscript with other manuscripts whose dates are known, and they're known because they're non-literary papyri where someone says, dear so-and-so, and he writes it in the year of uh, uh, the reign of Augustus, uh, his 14th year, or something like that. So we can pinpoint the date in time when we do that kind of thing. But there are other manuscripts from the second century as well. Uh, papyrus number 66, which is at the Bodmer Museum in Cologne, Switzerland, on the shores of Lake Geneva, is a remarkable manuscript that has most of John's gospel in it. It doesn't have the entirety of John anymore. The outside leaves have fallen off and uh, from chapters 14 on. It's, it's fairly fragmentary. But P66 is a manuscript that was dated somewhere between A.D. 150 and A.D. 200, and yet it's got most of John's Gospel in it. Really a remarkable text. We also have uh, several other manuscripts, P4, P64, P67. We've got others that are possibly second century, what's known as P75, which is a document that has both Luke and John in it, the, the vast majority of those verses.
P46 is the earliest document we have of Paul's letters. It's housed now at the Chester Beatty Museum in Dublin, Ireland, and at least most of it is. The rest of it is housed at the University of Michigan. This manuscript is dated at about AD 200, so right on the cusp between the second century and the third century, and it has today most of Paul's letters in it. Uh, we know that it had uh, 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 far more material than it has now, although we still have the majority of what it has today. The reason is because the scribe actually wrote out what the page number was, and so we can see some of the later pages and figure out exactly how much uh, this text would have had in it. Uh, these are some of our early manuscripts. Altogether, we have manuscripts from the second century or possibly the second or third century that number as many as 10 or 12 manuscripts that are dated to about that time period. Now, in terms of how much material of the New Testament they have, the remarkable thing is that approximately 43% of all the verses of the New Testament not the entirety of each verse, but 43% of parts of those verses, and in most instances, the majority of those verses, are found in these manuscripts that are dated to the second century or to the second slash third century. That's a, an amazing amount of material very early on for the New Testament. Then you get into the third century, and we have uh, quite a few more manuscripts. In the fourth century, basically, when, by the time we get to within 300 years of the completion of the New Testament, we have well over 100 manuscripts in Greek alone, not counting the, the other ancient languages, the other ancient versions, that have the text of the New Testament, including our first complete Greek New Testament manuscript that has every book of the New Testament. The entire New Testament is duplicated many times over in these manuscripts that we have through the first 300 years after the completion of the New Testament. There's nothing in the ancient world that comes close to that in terms of the completion of material and the date of the material. We just don't have any parallels at all that even stand a chance against the materials we have for the New Testament. So what scholars have to deal with is this embarrassment of riches of massive amounts of material. And on the other hand, they have to deal with the early text, and yet those early manuscripts very frequently uh, differ from each other. They typically differ from each other more than the later manuscripts do that were almost cranked out, uh, not by a printing press, but very, very uh, carefully produced, but on, its, on a standard text that was uh, changed significantly from the early text. So we've been talking about this embarrassment of riches. How much do we have of the average ancient uh, Greek author, Greek or Latin author, how much do we have of his literary remains? The average author has fewer than, and I'm giving a very liberal estimate here, fewer than 20 copies of his uh, literary remains still in existence. And most uh, of these uh, Greco-Roman authors would have just a handful, one, two, three, maybe six or seven copies, that's it. So uh, giving a generous estimate of 20 copies, if you were to stack those literary remains up, how tall would it be? Well, on average, it would end up being about four feet high. If we had 20 copies of their, the remains, you'd get up to four feet high. Now, take the New Testament manuscripts in the Greek and all the ancient versions, how high would that stack be? That would be closer to about a mile high. It's a huge difference between these ancient Greco-Roman authors and their literary remains and what we have for the New Testament. Now, if you were to wipe out all of the Greek manuscripts and all of the ancient versions of the New Testament, would we be left without a witness? Not at all. We also have the fathers of the church or ancient bishops and presbyters and elders and deacons who wrote commentaries and homilies on the New Testament. Beginning in the late first century, we start getting these church fathers who are making some minor comments on the New Testament as it was in a state of, of uh, production. It wasn't really yet regarded as the New Testament until uh, it became what's called canonized. That is when uh, the church recognized certain books and determined that certain books would be considered scripture, which didn't, it, it took some time for that to happen. But in the meantime, these patristic writers in the late first century, second century, third century, all the way up through typically the 13th century is how we count them, uh, are quoting from the New Testament and alluding to the New Testament. How much material do we have from the church fathers 
uh, in terms of quotations and allusions from the New Testament. Well, the best estimate is that we have well over one million quotations of the New Testament by the Church Fathers for this uh, period of time. That's a huge amount of resources, and the entire New Testament is reproduced again many times over in the writings of these Church Fathers. Finally, when you think in terms of the amount of material, there's another way to quantify this. Altogether, among our Greek manuscripts only, we have approximately two and a half million pages of manuscripts of the Greek New Testament, which the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts is dedicated to digitizing as much as we are allowed to and as much as we are able to. Those two and a half million pages uh, average out to about 500 pages per manuscript. So the average Greek New Testament manuscript is about 500 pages long. This is a, a significant amount of material. We're not dealing primarily with fragments, but with some lengthy materials, and very early on we get this. When you compare the New Testament to the other ancient Greco-Roman literature, the remarkable thing is the average other Greco-Roman literature, the average uh, author from Greece or from Rome, has no literary remains for at least 300 years while as the New Testament has well over 100 copies in Greek alone within the first 300 years of the completion of the New Testament.